Good day, chaps. So this is going to be the start of a project that's going to be a bit of an ongoing series. And one I've been putting off for a while, due to the scale and complexity of the subject. It's going to cover a huge variety of topics, from super heavy tank destroyers, air portable tank regiments, missiles that drove their users insane, experiments in Australia and much more. This is the study of the British heavy guided missile program, Malkara. Because this topic has so many overarching and parallel projects that tied into it, it's going to be easier to break it down to sections. This vehicle, the FV4010 and Malkara will be the core, and then afterwards we can go off on the tangents which ran as part of the project. And so our story begins in two places, the United Kingdom and Australia, with the development of three missiles the UK's Project J and Project E, and the Malkara missile system from Australia. Of the two British systems, English Electric were working on Project E, for a portable anti-tank guided missile with a heat warhead, while Project J was a proposal for a heavier anti-tank missile with a Hesh warhead. These missiles were proposed in a paper from early 1952, to provide the Royal Armoured Corps with a heavy anti-tank guided weapon with a 60 pound warhead, a weight of up to 200 pounds, a range of around 4,000 yards, and a high degree probability of killing any tank it hit, or at least incapacitating it. Meanwhile, the Australians had come up with the same idea around the same time. They too wanted a missile with a large Hesh warhead with a similar size and layout. The missile for them would be called Malkara, an Aboriginal word for shield. The United Kingdom and Australia quickly realised they wanted the same thing, and so the projects merged and Project J became Malkara. But why were these missiles needed? And what was the thinking of the time? Well, post-World War II, the UK was in a bit of a pickle, tank-wise. It had been rudely shocked during the Second World War and struggled to produce tanks and vehicles that were keeping parity with the enemy. Only doing so late into the war, and no sooner had the conflict ended than a new threat emerged, their former allies, the Soviets. With the Nazi threat beaten, the communist threat arose, and now there were thousands of Russian tanks sitting on the border looking for any slight provocation to invade. These Soviet tanks were more or less understood, and yet during the Berlin parades a new tank had been displayed, the IS-3. Now this new Soviet heavy tank caused a lot of concern for the British, more so than to be honest was needed. But at the time it became the new monster in the closet, and from then on all new anti-armour designs would inevitably be based around the idea of killing the IS-3. Even when that threat in all reality had passed, it still seemed to be the go-to threat to overcome. The situation with British tanks post-war did not, in the short term, help this situation either. The tanks of the time included vehicles like Centurion, Comet and Cromwell, as well as a smattering of tank destroyers, many still armed with the older 17-pounder guns, or worse. And yet the new 20-pounder gun, or 84mm, which had been ready since 1945, was only just being introduced into the Centurion in the form of the Mark III. Thus the UK began to look at a series of upgunning of platforms, even if only temporary solutions, with vehicles like the FV4101 Charioteer, the 4004 Conway, and of course the FV215 Super Heavy Tank Destroyer. Now this last vehicle came about due to a need to knock out tanks with at least 6 inches of well-sloped armour at a very long range. Something it was felt that even the new 120mm guns in development would be unable to achieve. Thus they simply went with the old adage of throw enough poo at something and hope it sticks. And by using a 183mm gun with a round containing 37 pounds of plastic explosive, they felt that ought to do the job. And the reasoning went that, even if it didn't kill the target outright, it would probably do enough damage to everything else on the tank or around it to clearly deliver the message. The FV215 itself was only a stopgap replacement until a similar heavy vehicle could come in that mounted guided weapons. 
This future heavy armoured vehicle, sporting missiles, would fill in the role of defeating any Soviet tank at long ranges, and in time it was felt would replace the Conqueror tanks due to come into service. The UK then set about designing a super heavy system which would mount the new Malkara missiles onto it, and provide the heavy support vehicle to the faster and more agile Centurion tanks and the new medium gun tank number 2 which was now being considered. This new vehicle would be the FV-4010 Heavy Tank Destroyer, Guided Weapon. This would replace Conqueror and FV-215 in service as the long range support system, although there was still a lot of uncertainty as to whether guns or missiles were indeed the future. Development of the Malkara was underway in Australia at the GAF or Government Aircraft Factories, with weapons testing being done at several sites including the Woomera rocket range. Various ideas were tried out, mostly in the guidance system, and Malkara, while wire guided, would also switch between having flares fitted or infrared systems and back to flares again over its life, and the first use of a wind tunnel to help develop missile was also used. The missile's creator was a Dr. William Butement, CBE, who had taken over the role of the first chief scientist in the Defence Scientific Service of the Australian Department of Supply and Development in April 1949, before heading up the weapons research establishment in 1955. Meanwhile, in 1953, design work in the UK production began on the firing platform, which would be built by Vickers at Elswick and designed by the FVRDE. At least six schemes were drawn up, each with a different layout and launching system. These were to be based on Centurion hulls, or in at least one case an FV-3802 hull, itself a 25-pounder based on Centurion parts, with each plan shown to carry between 16 to 20 missiles as a capacity. Alongside these, several smaller vehicles were considered to mount two to four missiles each. The chosen plan was a large, rear-mounted casemated design with 6 inches of frontal armour, although this would increase, and the missiles launched from the top and reloaded via butterfly hatch system. A wooden model was soon followed and the first vehicles were ready for 1956 in June. Now, you might have noticed that this vehicle does not look like the final drawings. Well, it's missing some tracks for a start. And there's a good reason for this, and one that was reflected in other British concepts of the time. During this period, the build-up of forces on the German border, NATO and the soon-to-be packed forces, were facing off against each other. This meant that every vehicle not used in essential training and development was either in Germany or had to be in a situation where it was battle-ready at short notice. And naturally, being the UK, there was always a shortage of vehicles. Thus, the order went out that any project or experiment using the existing chassis would not be able to alter them to any extent that they could not quickly and with minimal fuss be turned back into the base vehicle at a moment's notice. With tanks such as the FV-4004 Conway, this involved making the turret taller than needed, for example, so that the gun recoiled above the turret ring and no changes were therefore needed to the hull. If a war broke out, the vehicle could very quickly be converted back into a gun tank. The same could not be said for the FV-4010. Any full project would need to chop up a valuable Centurion in the beginning just to start making it, and there was no real evidence that it would even work. What was needed was something between a mock-up and the real thing, that combined in theory the best of both worlds. Therefore, they built a mobile trailer system, one that would act as a missile launching facility and be the same weight, size and dimensions as the proposed finished vehicle and operate in the same manner too, but be towable on a trailer base with an auxiliary power plant to represent the tank systems. These would be built in three stages. The stage one was just a frame to get the basic dimensions needed and test a few of the ideas such as the base plate. Stage two would be the wheeled trailer version, fully plated although without the armour added, and stage 3 would be the final vehicle on the Centurion chassis. The vehicle itself had a proposed armour layout that was increased during the development, from 6 inches to 8 and 3 quarter inches, 
or 222 millimeters at 45 degrees for 313 millimeters of armor over the casemate. The upper nose was now 6.5 inches or 165 millimeters, angle of 45 degrees, for 233 millimeters, while the lower nose plate was 4 inches, 101 millimeters, at 45 degrees for 142 millimeters. The trailer itself, like the full version, had a four-man crew. The commander and the driver gunner were located in the main fighting body and each had their own hatch and cupola above them. In the rear were stowed the missiles and it had two loaders, or fixers, slotted around them that could lay the missile into the various parts. Now the Malkara missile was particularly large being arguably the largest non-aircraft launched anti-tank missile ever made. At 1.9 meters long, 200 pounds in weight or 90 kilograms, and nearly 12 inches of wing on either side, the massive missile took up a lot of space. The solution was to have the missile designed in such a way that it was plug and play in nature. The main body of the missile would be in one section and the wings and so on in another. When the vehicle was in action, the crew would use the unique loading system to put the missile together. This was essentially a butterfly hatch which comprised of a hatch with a launcher attached to either side on an erector arm. On the top of the vehicle would be the current missile in its ready to fire state. And inside, on the launch cradle, a duplicate system was found extending below, with the tray empty. The two loaders would then place the missile body onto the tray, attach the wings, front and back with a simple slot-in system, place the rear motor parts and attach the arming wire to the missile. This whole process could be done in 15 seconds, although only 30 seconds or 2 rounds per minute sustained fire was required. This was of course dependent on the range of the target, as being a wire-guided system the flip and reload could not begin until the previous missile had struck the target. Doing so would sever the cable and the missile would lose control. Once the top missile had launched, a small arming cable came free and armed the missile. This prevented detonation above the vehicle roof in an accident. Then the whole hatch would flip 180 degrees, presenting the two loaders with a now empty tray while the new missile was in a ready to fire position. This could be done over and over again until the vehicle ran out of missiles, shooting a steady stream of guided missiles at the enemy from a now well-armoured and low-down hull position. To assist with the aiming, the missile could be traversed 30 degrees either side and was elevated to 15 degrees to fire a standard. If the vehicle was ambushed or an enemy appeared in a range too short for the normal method to fire the missile and the gunner acquire it, a preset program flight could also be used in which the round was fired more or less dead ahead in a shotgun method. The vehicle underwent several months of tests down at Wimmera range, although there were delays as the vehicle had been damaged when unloading and the Aussies insisted on certain safety features such as the warhead release cable and so on. But the vehicle was found to be functional and the missile accurate and easy enough to control although there were some issues in a strong crosswind due to the large surface area. Incidentally, the whole process was observed through an observation tank that was made up from an old M3 Lee. The FV-4010 trailers were then sent back to the UK for further testing and demonstrations in late 1950. And in this film, we can see one of the launch trailers. The platforms were last seen up at Kukubri in Scotland, and they only ever got as far as Stage 2. No fully complete Stage 3 platforms were ever made. In Scotland, the missiles did not perform as well. An opinion was changing on Malkara itself. However, this was not the end of the story. For during all this, not only was there a rival missile from the UK, which aimed to supplant Malkara, but still use the same launch vehicles, in the form of Orange William, but Malkara would also go airborne with the Cyclops Squadron and the Hornets, as well as undergo critical reviews in not only how it worked, but the type of warhead it used, and many tests would be carried out. And most of this was parallel to what we've covered today. Join us in the next part, while we discuss the other missiles that drove its user mad, and why Vickers would stab the team in the back. 
But until then, please do like and subscribe and all that tomfoolery. And we'll see you shortly. Toodlepip. These were seen at the Lulworth camp where they demonstrated the missiles to various military bodies